Welcome to Midweek Mysteries, and thank you for being here. I am your host, Nick Ryan. If you're new to the show, Midweek Mysteries is a shorter version of our full-length Sunday episodes, where we also enjoy giving a personal shout-out to our newest supporters, so please be sure to tune in. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, please become a patron at patreon.com forward slash paranormal mysteries. Or if you prefer to make a one-time donation, please visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash paranormal. And as always, subscribing to the podcast and sharing it with your friends is one of the best ways to show your support, and we appreciate it. Now let's see what today's storytellers have to say. Today's first midweek mystery comes to us from Missy. Missy's story is called Super Creepy House. Missy says, Love the podcast. I've been listening for a long time and always enjoy the experiences relayed on this platform. I want to tell you about the house I moved into when I was about 18. First, I need to give a brief description of the house so you can better understand when you hear about my experiences. The house is in downtown Rochester, Michigan. Rochester is an old town, and this house was built in the Edwardian era, probably around 1900 or 1910. It still has the single-pane, rattly windows, iron doorknobs with skeleton keyholes, and all wood floors. When I lived there, it had the old steam radiators that hissed when they kicked on, and one of those furnaces in the basement that looked like it came out of the movie Nightmare on Elm Street. And there actually is an Elm Street, two streets over from this house. The house was also located about three blocks from an extremely old cemetery. So, when I was about 18, I moved into this house with my then boyfriend, who turned into my first husband, and his sister. My boyfriend's mother had passed away in the back bedroom many years prior, and I had heard that someone had hung themselves in the old wooden detached garage, but I don't know this for a fact. My boyfriend and his sister lived in this house their entire lives. The house always made me feel like I was being watched. I will tell you just a few of the bigger events that happened to me there. One weekend, my boyfriend and his sister had gone up north. They owned a cabin in northern Michigan, and we would go up north frequently to work on the cabin and to get away. This particular weekend, I couldn't go with them because I had just started a new job and I had to work. It was late on Sunday night, probably about 11.30, and I heard them come in the back door and go into the basement. Now, when you walked into the kitchen, there was a door that led to the basement. You open the door, go down about three steps, and to your left was the back entry door, and to your right was the rest of the stairs down to the basement. So I'm in our bedroom relaxing when I heard the back door open, footsteps going down the stairs, things moving in the basement, muffled voices, and I figured they had come home from up north and were unloading things from the truck and taking them to the basement. I thought I would pop in and say hi and see how the weekend went. So I go through the kitchen and open the door that leads to the back door and the basement. And it's pitch black and silent. Nothing. I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack. I shut the kitchen door and ran back to my bedroom. I turned on all the lights and watched TV until they really did get back home about an hour and a half later. This was in the late 80s, so no cell phones to call them or anything. Another time, I was home alone again, and I decided to take a bath. The bathroom was really small, only about 8 feet by 8 feet. It had the old cast iron bathtub with claw feet and the toilet where you had to pull the chain because the tank was way up by the ceiling. I'm relaxing in the bathtub and I can hear footsteps outside in the hall and in the dining room on the old wooden flooring. Now I know that nobody came into the house because the front door was only 15 feet from the bathroom and it was so loud when it opened I would have heard someone come in. I am kind of freaking out just being really still and listening when I hear the footsteps come right up to the bathroom door. And Nick, I kid you not, the doorknob slowly starts turning. At this point, I am frozen, just staring at the doorknob and praying the door doesn't open. I was afraid to breathe 
because I thought whoever was out there would hear me. The doorknob slowly turns one way, and then the other, and then stops. After about 10 minutes or so, I try to get out of the tub as quietly as possible, and I put my robe on, and I open the door. I go all around the house, and there's nothing. Nobody. What the heck just happened? Another time, my boyfriend and I were just laying in bed. It was about 11 p.m., when suddenly, there was a loud bang on each of the windows. And I don't mean just one window, then another, or another. I mean all three windows, simultaneously. Bang! Two of the windows faced the driveway, and one looked out into the backyard. There was a huge streetlight by the garage at the top of the driveway, so we could clearly see that no one was out there. The windows in this house were those old, single-pane windows that when you bumped them, they would rattle in the window frames. So when the super loud bang happened, it was loud. It sounded like a giant fist struck each window at the same time, and I can't explain this. Again, if it had been kids or something, we would have definitely seen them. One more incident for now, and I'll wrap this up. So my boyfriend and I moved to the bedroom upstairs. The entire upstairs was one bedroom and a small bathroom. It had the slanted ceilings and little six-sided windows in it. At the base of the stairs was a door. These old houses had doors on almost every single doorway in the house. The bathroom up there didn't work and was under renovation, so we had to go downstairs if we needed to go. One night in the middle of the night, I woke up because I had to use the bathroom. I went downstairs and did so. I then closed the door behind me and started up the stairs to go back to bed. As I am sleepily going up the stairs, I hear someone coming up the stairs behind me. Now I know I closed the door, so there is no way that someone could be behind me. Talk about instantly becoming fully awake. I didn't want to look behind me, so I ran up the stairs as fast as I could, and I tried to kind of jump over my boyfriend to my side of the bed really quick. Well, when I did, he didn't know what was going on, and instinctively put his knee up to defend himself, and I ran into his leg and broke a bone in my hand. I have so many experiences in that house that it's unreal. Sorry this was a bit long, but I could literally write a book about what went on in that house. Thanks, Nick. Missy. Our next midweek mystery comes to us from Casey. Casey's story is called Game Night. Casey says, Hey Nick, I've shared to your podcast once before, and I thought it was time for me to share another story. I listen at work and I'm all caught up now. Last time, I shared a really dark story, but this one is one of my lighter encounters. When I was around four or five, my mom worked in a nursing home as an activities coordinator for the residents. She would create a calendar monthly and come up with different games to play, or movie nights or parties to keep them involved and their minds active. Whenever they would have a game night, my mom would bring me to play with them. We always had a set group of people that would come to play every game night, and of these were a couple, Wilma and Harry. We held game night in a room connected to the dining room by these big glass doors that you could see through. One of the doors was open, though, on this particular night. The kitchen staff was cleaning up the dining room, as it was about seven, and dinner was finished. That couple were not at this game night, and I was visibly upset when I saw that Wilma was sitting in the dining room in her wheelchair by herself. There was a member of the kitchen staff wiping off the table that she was sitting at, but not saying a word to her. I didn't like that Wilma was being left out, so I asked Mom why she wouldn't come in and play or why someone wouldn't bring her in with the rest of us. My mom ignored my question, but got up and shut the door, which only made me more upset, as I could still see her through the glass. I brought it up again on the way home in the car, and my mom insisted there wasn't anyone sitting in the dining room. She told me years later that Wilma had died a few nights prior to that game night, and that I was the only one able to see her. Even so, I still wish she would have come and played with us. Thanks for reading, and I can't wait to share more stories. Take care, Casey. 
Our next story of the night comes from Mary. Mary's story is called Creature on the Tracks. Mary says, Hi Nick, I hope this finds you well. I wanted to share a story with you. Almost ten years ago, a friend and myself decided to take a walk on the railroad tracks close to my home. It was close to midnight, and before we got on the tracks, I had a feeling that we shouldn't. I didn't want to say anything, but as we started walking, a voice in my head kept saying, Turn around. We had been walking for about ten minutes, when we realized something or someone was following us. Whatever it was, it was too far back for us to see its face. But when we started walking back towards the unknown person, the closer we got, the more horrifying it was. I'm not sure if it was a man or some kind of creature, almost a combination of both. I thought maybe I was seeing things, but I could tell that my friend was startled as well. I asked him if he saw it, and to my horror, he started describing the man-like creature that was now a few feet away from us. There was no other way for us to get back to the main road from the tracks without walking back the way we had came. The tracks were surrounded by trees. We knew that we were going to have to walk past whatever this creature was. As we walked closer to the creature, it got very cold. The feeling of unease surrounded us, and I really thought we were going to die. You could almost feel the evil from this creature. I'm not sure why I did what I did next, but I picked up a few rocks from the tracks and threw them at the creature. To our surprise, they went straight through it. The creature then began to disappear and slowly fade away. The next day, I saw a church sign that read, God will provide a stone for every trouble. Then about two weeks later, there were some police officers on the railroad tracks with their guns pointed down at something on the ground. When they were asked about this event later, they simply said that they couldn't discuss it. I'm not one to give power to evil or make up stories. My friend and I both saw the creature that night, and the feelings it gave me were horrific. I've never set foot on those tracks again, and I do believe that there are truly evil beings here on Earth. I'm sorry for the lengthy story. Thanks for listening and providing this platform for our stories to be shared. I love your podcast. Thanks again. Mary Beth. I contacted Mary Beth again and asked her for some more details regarding her experience. And this is what she had to say. Thank you so much for taking the time to read my story. Initially, it was too dark for me to see the creature's face. It was more of just an outline of what appeared to be a man based on size, but almost like he was hunched over slightly. As we got closer, I could almost see some shadows across its face from the moon. It had an animal-like quality to its face, but its eyes were a hollow red color. It scared me so much that I couldn't sleep for days, and I was worried I was going to see it again. I started researching paranormal experiences, and I would say the closest thing I've found would have to be the dogman creatures. Although, this creature wore a long, coat-like piece of clothing. I'm not sure what the police had down on the tracks. I went to high school with a friend whose dad was a police officer, and he asked him about it, but his dad shrugged it off. I posted a shorter version of my story on a website years ago, and a few people from my town commented, saying that they had heard stories of cat-like creatures. I also learned from some of my older family members that years and years ago, a group of people got together and actually devil-worshipped about a half a mile from the tracks in the woods. I'm not sure if that's true, though, because I think that was a story they heard when they were kids. Our next midweek mystery comes to us from Gigi. Gigi's story is called Mannequin Ghost. Gigi says, Dear Nick, I've been interested in the paranormal since childhood, but it wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties that I had my first and only paranormal experience. I had been having a recurring nightmare for months about being in a house and suddenly realizing all of the doors and windows were wide open. In the nightmare, I would always realize an intruder was entering the house just as I was running to lock the door or window it was entering. 
One night, I was having this nightmare again in my apartment, where I lived alone. In the middle of the nightmare, I bolted upright in bed, screaming at the top of my lungs. As I was screaming, I opened my eyes, and was inches away from a six-foot white figure that looked like a mannequin wearing a toga. I didn't have my glasses on, so I could only make out the outline, and I couldn't clearly see any facial features. It appeared androgynous, had short hair, and the thing that strikes me most about it is that it looked like what I imagined God would look like when I was a little girl. It didn't make any sound, and it disappeared after I got up to turn on the light. The impression I got was honestly that it seemed taken aback as though it didn't expect me to jump out of bed and see it. It took so long for my brain to process the situation because I wasn't dreaming about anything like this figure. My nightmare was about a man breaking in and wearing black. I have no history of sleep paralysis, delusions or drug use, and I didn't sense anything malevolent about this entity. My best guess is that it was a protective spirit that was somehow trying to help me with my distress. The closest I can compare the experience to is when you suddenly spot a mouse in your house. You know it's not supposed to be there indoors, but it doesn't pose a threat, and it doesn't want to be seen. Thanks, Nick. I love the podcast. As we come to the end of this edition of Midweek Mysteries, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for tuning in and supporting the podcast. And a special thank you goes out to Missy, KC, Mary, and of course Gigi for writing in and sharing their experiences with all of us. If any of you have thoughts, advice, or a similar experience that you'd like to share with one of tonight's storytellers, please email me and I'll be sure to forward your message onto them. If you've witnessed something unexplainable and you'd like to have your story shared on the podcast, please contact me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com or visit paranormalmysteriespodcast.com and click on the Tell Your Story link. All of our contact information can be found in the show notes. Until next time, I hope you all have a safe and healthy rest of the week, and we'll see you back here on Sunday with our next full-length episode. From all of us at the Paranormal Mysteries Podcast, thank you so much for listening, and remember, don't wait for the unknown to come to you. Get out there and find it.